Intuitive Machine's failure to land Athena on the surface of the moon is just a sign of more things to come, but it's not hopeless. Intuitive Machines tried to land the Nova C lander Athena on the surface of the moon. It is their second landing attempt, I am too. And on March 6, it failed to land. It was even worse landing than their previous attempt, I am one. It was pretty clear from really early on, as you listened to Mission Control, that it was not a successful landing. Something had gone on worse than the tipped over Nova C that I am one experienced in 2024. Intuitive Machines is a publicly traded company and during the recent earnings call we heard a little more from the CEO Steve Altimus about what actually happened during that landing. Not a lot of details but we did get some clarity as to what went wrong. We identified three primary contributors that affected the IM2 landing. One, laser altimeter interference. In the final phase of descent, we saw signal noise and distortion that did not allow for accurate altitude readings. He probably meant signal to noise. So the actual readings, the real data that was coming in was being crowded out by all the noise, all the distortion that was coming in at the same time. It was too weak of a signal to be able to rely on. That's sort of what happened with iSpace. The Hakutu R mission, April 2023. They had a laser altimeter that passed over the rim of a crater and it thought that it was closer to the surface than it was. It actually thought it was on the surface. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that based on the altimeter readings, it thought that it had landed when in fact it was still five kilometers away and therefore it landed very hard and failed and that was the first iSpace mission. iSpace is going to be celebrating hopefully a successful landing. I'm hoping I'm crossing fingers in about three weeks. Crater recognition tuning. Our optical navigation used imagery from LRO at 100 kilometers from the lunar surface that could not accurately account for how craters appear at lower altitudes with south pole lighting conditions as you approach the landing site. And this is a big one. This is why we're going to see more and more of this kind of challenge popping up and why one of my clients is trying to make a difference in this area to add to the body of knowledge so that we can see more success with lunar landers and lunar rovers and lunar navigation in general. When you are exploring an unknown terrain, there's not a lot to go on. You might think we've had orbiters around the moon for decades. Don't we have plenty of data? Don't we have these maps of the lunar surface? And we do. But there is a big difference from seeing something from afar versus seeing something close up. Could you drive around your neighborhood or your city from a satellite image? You couldn't. It's taken from too far away. Satellite images help us to get a big picture overview, but not help us to do local driving, local terrain mapping. What you need is in situ data, real hard data at the site that can tell you what it looks like on the ground or what it looks like from an aerial view, from as you're coming down, as you're landing, what those different altitudes look like. We are used to this when we ascend and descend on a plane. And that's generally when most of us see that kind of view. Some of you might be drone operators. You might see it then. Some of you might have other means of getting up higher than others. Maybe you work in a skyscraper, I don't know. But when you see something up high, but not as high as a satellite, you know it looks different than it does on the ground. And you know it looks different than it does from a satellite image. And another challenge with the moon, and the moon being my specialty, lunar, lunar regolith in particular, um, it is, dead world? Magnificent desolation is what Buzz Aldrin called it. It is really a barren landscape. Everything looks a bit the same. It's kind of like a desert. If you're walking around desert, every sand dune looks about the same for the most part. There's not a lot of variation from what our human eyes are used to. There's certainly variation in the types of craters. And if you look at this moon here, I mean, all the craters are named. But when we humans are looking at it, or when we're trying to program software, it's really difficult to differentiate between the different craters or between the different landscape markers. That cat is on the other side of the door. I don't know if you can hear that. It's really different in our own eyes. And when we're trying to program software to differentiate between all the different craters and all the different landmarks that look relatively the same from what we're used to, we humans are used to looking at things like oceans and lakes and rivers and mountain ranges, things that we can really differentiate in terms of color. Artificial Artificial intelligence or generative AI can only do so much to tell us what to expect. If you have something from a satellite image, it can pretend to know what it would look like a little farther down, a little closer to the surface, or even surface level driving around, but it can't really know. There was one more complication that Steve Altimus talked about. Terrain and lighting effects. South pole topography and low angle sunlight created long shadows and dim lighting conditions 
that challenge the precision capability of our landing system. And this one I've got personal experience with, maybe you do too. Even when I'm driving around my own neighborhood or you know my own town, if it's dim, if it's nighttime, it looks so different that I actually have trouble navigating and it's just a limitation of mine. The shadows can really trick when you're trying to visually measure how tall things are or how far away they are. There's also complications when we're talking about the craters, the rims, any kind of topological feature. They might look a certain height or a certain distance away, but that could be an optical illusion. The regolith composition is different at different parts of the moon, and it also could be different depending on the age of the crater. You actually need real imagery to show the computer what it truly looks like. And if enough imagery is input into these algorithms, into these software programs, these databases, then you can actually have enough so that the generative AI is more realistic. Remember, we don't have like GPS on the moon, not yet not to help us. That is something that is being worked on. We're gonna to have to get used to a new surface and get a better intuitive understanding of what we're seeing on the surface in order to understand how to safely land there and how to safely traverse. As you can see, I am one had its challenges. I am two had its challenges. I am three is in the works. These kinds of problems are gonna to continue to pop up just because it is so challenging to work with so little information and also so little redundancy. So some of the things that Steve Altimus mentioned that they are doing at Intuitive Machines to prepare IM3, they are doing redundancy in their altimeter systems. If you remember from IM1, that was also an altimeter problem where there was like a switch that was not turned on. And so they didn't have an altimeter operational as they were trying to land IM1. And so now they're doing redundancy in altimeters and they're also doing rigorous testing. We've identified the issues and are making the necessary changes we believe will get us there on IM3. Here's what's different. We've added dissimilar and redundant altimeters to the sensor suite, and they're going through more rigorous and extreme flight-like testing than we've done before. We've incorporated an additional lighting-independent sensor for surface velocity measurements. We've expanded onboard terrain crater database for enhanced navigation across the surface of the moon. You have to remember that these missions, at least the Intuitive Machines mission, is CLIPS missions. These are really small awards, little money, about $100 million, and that's that's quite small when it comes to these types of missions. I just looked it up. It's $116.9 million that NASA awarded Intuitive Machines for IM2. That's not actually a lot of money when it comes to doing something so novel, developing a whole new landing system. They really have to make some hard decisions when it comes to what they're spending their money on, what their weight allocation is, what their volume is, limit is, what their electrical limit is, what their, um, their broadcast communications limit is. I mean, there's just a lot of trade-offs when it comes to a mission this small. I can't really blame them for not having redundancy with every single system because they can't afford to do so with such a small mission. But with IM3, they are making the decision to have that redundancy, at least with the altimeters. What would help even more is data. And that is where my client comes in. I'm not gonna mention their name, but hopefully I'll be talking about it a bit more later this year, where they are actually trying to gather this data for real in multiple different sources and have it be a database of actual real data, not just for landing purposes, but for roving purposes. We collected the most detailed imagery of the Lunar South Pole on mission two, and we're feeding this unique flight data directly into our machine learning algorithms to improve crater tracking and navigation performance in these extreme, extreme conditions. Intuitive Machines has also been awarded a NASA contract for the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, along with Lunar Outpost and Astrolab. They have a vehicle called Razor, Reusable Autonomous Crude Exploration Rover. NASA intends to choose at least one of these lunar train vehicles to fly on a future Artemis mission, and they also have international partners that are also committed to doing rovers as well. I feel like we got a little bit spoiled with all the successful JPL Mars missions that have done so phenomenally well, but you have to remember those missions were quite expensive, and these CLIPS missions are not. These rovers are even less expensive. We have to learn how to do these things more affordably, or else we're not going to do it on a large scale. The moon at this point does not have landing pads. It does not have roads. It does not have street lights. All of those things are actually being developed um, at various stages of study. But at this point, we don't have them. And so we need to learn how to operate without roads. We need to learn how to operate without the lighting conditions that are ideal. We need to learn how to rough it safely 
because you don't want your astronauts abandoned. And these rovers particularly are human rated rovers. They will be carrying humans. Not all of the rovers are. For example, China's Chang'e missions, the later ones at least, have had successful uncrewed rovers and uncrewed landers. Those are smaller landers. Those are smaller rovers. And they've had great success but they've had successes with uncrewed rovers. We are trying to do Artemis with crewed rovers. China has their own human lunar program as well. We are gonna keep making the mistakes of not understanding the terrain, not understanding what we're looking at as we're coming down and as we're roving around until we get this data, until we cooperate. And it is an international cooperation. The client that I'm working with is working internationally with multiple countries to bring together the best data. The more data that we have, the better we can program our software, the better we can program our AI, the better chances we have to have safe missions, landing, roving, and hopefully bringing people to the surface of the moon.